Welcome to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. In the ancient Celtic calendar, Beltane was one of the four most important festivals of the year. For the Celts, their year resembled a wheel that rolled through the seasonal festivals. In bulk in February, Beltane in May, Lammas in August, and after the harvest came Samhain. When the world around them was changing from the frostbitten and sleeping landscapes of winter into the thaw and first signs of spring, to the abundance of life in summer, and the preparation for the long months ahead in autumn. These were the times when our Celtic ancestors would make a connection with nature and the other world, celebrating life and, of course, change. This festival of light marked the start of the summer, when the sun's warmth would aid growth of both livestock and crops. With torches said to be lit from the rays of the sun, the druids of the ancient world are thought to have lit bonfires that in turn would reignite the extinguished fires of every hearthside and home. With this episode, we will discover more about Beltane in Scotland, where the festival continues to this day. There are a few theories attached to the word Beltane and what it means. The ancient Greek historian Diodorus Siculus named Cornwall Belerion, which is thought to mean bright or shining land. As soon as I read that, I immediately thought of Shan from the Celtic Myths and Legends podcast. However, in Scotland and Irish Gaelic, the last part of the word, tain, means fire. If we consider the first half of the word, bell, there are some interesting points to note here too. Bell, a Celtic sun god, also known as Bellinus, appears in many forms across the Celtic world. For example, he was known as Belli to the Welsh, the father of Lud, and also said to have been the husband of Don. In Gaulish Celtic mythology, Belinus was a god who was associated with light. As Baal, he is said to be the possible husband of Danu in Irish mythology, where the festival of Beltane was also known as Setshamain. If we concentrate our gaze in one area, though, it does become all the more interesting. The Celts considered their gods to be elemental beings of the other world, beings of light. And perhaps, as has been suggested in the past, Beltane does indeed mean bright, brilliant or other world fire. Across Scotland at Beltane, you might find displays ranging from quiet affairs to the incredible. Edinburgh, for instance, hosts a wonderful festival on Colton Hill, where Beltane is welcomed at the moonrise of May Day Eve. Edar Dathain Beltane, between two Beltane fires. Returning to the far distant past for a moment, and according to the 9th century Gloucester Cormac, two fires were kindled with sacred wood and lit by druids. The animals were then driven between them in a magical fertility rite, in a bid to protect them from harm and disease in the months and year ahead. Bonfires were kindled in sympathetic magic to encourage the sun's warmth to penetrate the earth. In Mackenzie's Scottish folklore and folklife, he gives us a fascinating insight into the ceremony in the latter part of the 18th century. He writes, Before these fires were lit, all house fires had to be extinguished and brands taken from the bonfires to relight them. A brand was kept whirling around about and being carried to a house and was called a day and day, brightness of the god, a term also applied to lightning or heavenly fire. On Beltane morning, it was customary to assemble and watch the dance of the new sun, which was believed to whirl round three times on rising above the horizon. Faces were washed in May dew for protection against the evil eye. There was dancing about the Beltane fires, and luck was secured by leaping through the flames and smoke. Even domesticated animals were driven over the embers for protection. Bannocks were baked at a fire, ceremonially eaten, after portions had been cast into the fire as offerings or flung over shoulders. 
When I was researching the baking of the bannock, I came across the thought that whoever got the most burnt piece of the oat cake was a sacrifice and had to jump over the fire. And that in ancient times, the fate of the chosen might have been more sinister. Sacrificing lives, whether human or animal, is something we might well struggle with these days. I did find a description concerning sacrifice, that in the ancient Celtic rite and rituals concerning Beltane, cattle were singed with the flame of a lit torch, or cut so that they spilled blood, and this was a sacred offering to the sun god. In the Scottish Highlands, the Gaels believed that the realms in which the Fae lived were underground, but it was within our human realm that they tended their cattle or foraged and roamed unseen. The Fae held significant festivals on the last night of every quarter. These times were called Hulatha Chinre. On the nights before Beltane, the first of summer, Halomas and the first of winter, the fairies are given to leaving their underground home and taking away any human, though men more so, and that they find helpless, unguarded or unwary. In Lady Wilde's Legends, Charms and Superstitions of Ireland, she mentions something rather similar. It reads, The fairies are in the best of humours upon May Eve, and the music of the fairy pipes may be heard all throughout the night. While the fairy folk are dancing upon the wrath, it is then that they carry off young people to join their revels, and if a girl has once danced to the fairy music, she will move ever after with such fascinating grace that it has passed into a proverb to say of a good dancer, she has danced to fairy music on the hill. Of the folklore I've read, there seems to be a preoccupation with luck and protecting oneself against the evil eye or malicious intent. Round branches used to protect doorways and households and cattle, and also a wisp of straw called a sop sail, which literally means a spittle wisp, was taken to sprinkle the doorposts and houses to preserve them from harm. An excerpt from Campbell's Witchcraft and Second Sight in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland reads, On the night of Beltane Eve, witches were awake, and went about as hares to take their produce, milk, butter and cheese from the cows, People who believed in their existence were as earnest to counteract their machinations. Tar was put behind the ears of the cattle, and at the root of the tail, the animals were sprinkled with urine to keep them from fighting. The house was hung with round tree, and the fairies were kept away from the farm for the rest of the year. If any came to ask for rennet, it should not be on any account given to them. It would be used for taking the substance out of the giver's own dairy produce. In Shetland, Ernest Marwick tells us that there was once a great feast called Beltane Foy, where bonfires were made, boys and men would dance around them excitedly, and many made it a point of honour to jump or leap over the flame. But in Orkney no such festivities took place. In fact, a period of bad weather was known as the Beltane Turls. If there were any animals born around Beltane, they were expected to fare badly, and that children, up to the time of the First World War, New May, as a time when their winter boots were taken away from them, and no matter the weather, they went barefoot until after the harvest. In Fraser's The Golden Bow, we have an interesting description of Beltane in the Scottish Highlands, where bonfires, known as the Beltane Fires, were kindled with great ceremony upon the 1st of May, and that the traces of human sacrifices at them were particularly clear and undeniable. He writes, The custom of lighting the bonfires lasted in various places far into the 18th century, and the descriptions of the ceremony by writers of that period present such a curious and interesting picture of ancient heathendom surviving in our own country that I will reproduce them in the words of their authors. The fullest of the descriptions is the one bequeathed to us by John Ramsay, Laird of Ochthertire near Creef, the patron of Burns and the friend of Sir Walter Scott, and he says... But the most considerable of the druidical festivals is that of Beltane, or May Day, which was lately observed in some parts of the Highlands with extraordinary ceremonies. Like the other public worship of the druids, the Beltane feast seems to have been performed on hills or eminences. They thought it degrading to him whose temple is the universe, to suppose that he would dwell in any house made with hands. Their sacrifices were therefore offered in the open air, frequently upon the tops of hills, where they presented with the grandest views of nature, and where nearest 
the seat of warmth and order, and, according to tradition, such was the manner of celebrating this festival in the Highlands within the last hundred years. In Glenlyon, Perthshire, there is a ritual still carried out to this day. The time has not altered. The Glen Du Nagarf Clack, or the Crooked Glen of the Stones, is home to a small shilling, known either as Taina Kilach, which is Scottish Gaelic for the House of the Old Woman, or Taina Mbodach, which is Scottish Gaelic for House of the Old Man. Within a small turf-roofed hut contains a fascinating link to Scotland's ancient Celtic past. Inside are sizeable water stones thought to be from the riverbed of the Lion itself. The largest stone represents the Kelech, old woman, as well as a stone representing the Bodach, old man, and their daughter, Nian. The stones are quite striking. The figures are of a curious shape, and there really has something of the human form about them. In Scotland, Kelech translates as old woman, hag or veiled one. She is a mother goddess found in Gaelic mythology, associated with nature, the harvest, water, streams and wells, a guardian spirit of wild animals and is the personification of winter. And in Gaelic mythology, she features in many tales, capable of transformation, creation and destruction. A ritual exists in Glen Lyon that has been occurring for centuries. With every Beltane, the stone figures of the Caelach along with her husband Bodach and daughter Nian are taken from the shilling and placed so that they are facing down the glen. There they remain until Sawain, and the reason for doing so, well, there is a legend. The Kilik and her family were given shelter by the people of the Glen. In return for their kindness, the land remained fertile and abundant. When the time came for the Kilik to depart, they left the stones and a promise was made that as long as the stones looked out over the Glen from Beltane to Sawain and were hidden away from the harsh winter, then the land would always provide. It is thought that the Gaelic and her kin were of a benevolent nature, keeping a watchful eye on the cattle that grazed nearby, rather than representing the wild forces of nature. When I first wrote this episode, I had originally included the names and locations of various Beltane festivals for this year, but time has changed the course of the months and the year ahead. So I've included a couple of links to the spectacular Beltane festival celebrated in Edinburgh in the past. What I do have is something a little different. What I hope is as fascinating and rewarding for you as it has been for me. While researching this episode, I came upon different rituals for celebrating Beltane. But please, for your safety and my peace of mind, do not light bonfires or small fires in your homes, gardens or countryside. What I'm going to describe is on a far smaller scale. Please... Always be extremely careful, and you might well laugh considering what I'm about to describe, but just please be careful. A Beltane Sacrifice For this we need a candle, paper, pen, and a bowl or flame-proof dish will do. So, take a moment to think. Perhaps you feel as though this is a time to release yourself from things that are weighing you down. You may want to move on from situations, feelings or issues that have been holding you back. Do you find yourself thinking of what you would like to do and of the things that prevent you from doing so? Take your piece of paper and write down your hopes for the year ahead and what you would be willing to sacrifice in order to grow. Then light the candle. This is your belting fire. Carefully light the paper and let it safely burn to ashes in the container. If you want, you can end the ceremony by dancing around the candle until the paper is completely burned. This can even be done as a meditation. Close your eyes. Imagine you are sitting before a fire. Feel the heat of its warmth on your skin. The scent of the burning wood. The glow of burning embers. In your hand is the piece of paper you wrote everything on it that you feel you could sacrifice in order to grow. Place the paper on the fire and watch as it turns into ashes. Feel the burden of everything holding you back from growth fade away. Before you leave the fireside, 
You might like to imagine that you hear the beating of a drum that encourages you to dance around the fire. Do so and feel your spirit soar. I hope you have enjoyed today's episode and that you are all safe and well. My continued thanks for listening to the podcast, especially now when some days feel uncertain and we all have so much in our minds. Please feel free to get in touch. Email is mlegendlore at gmail.com. Twitter is at loremyth. We are also on Facebook or patreon.com forward slash mythlegendlore. Thank you as always to my wonderful Patreon family. We are going to do something a wee bit different and special in the next few days. And to all of you guys, please take care for now. I'm Siobhan Clark. Thank you for listening to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. <laughs>